Uh, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher with Lean Frontiers and I will be your host for the day. Just a few points of logistics before we get started. If you have questions throughout our presentation, you'll find in the right side toolbar, the GoToWebinar toolbar, that you can submit questions through that. You'll also find that if you're interested in downloading the materials, you'll find those in the materials section of that same toolbar. This session is being recorded and we'll make this available to you within 24 hours after the session ends. Please feel free to share this with those in your organization as it's free as if the, the live session is now. Today's session uh, will last for anywhere from 45 minutes to 60 minutes, um, just depending upon questions and so forth. So just uh, plan your time accordingly. Um, I'd like to introduce our presenter here, and then we'll jump right into the presentation, Norbert uh, Majerus. Uh, beginning in 2005, Norbert implemented a principles-based lean product development process at three global innovation centers uh, of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. And then for more than a decade, uh, he served as Goodyear's lean champion in research and development. Um, and has since, Norbert, you have since retired. So in the, right. last, in the last year or so. Uh, in 2016, Norbert published his first book, Lean Driven Innovation, which received the coveted Chingo Prize Award. Also in 2016, under uh, Norbert's guidance, uh, Goodyear R&D organization applied for and received the AME Excellence uh, Award not uh, an easy thing to capture. So both the Shingo Prize and AME Excellence Award, thanks in large part to some of Norbert's work. Uh, Norbert also serves as the Lean Product and Process Development Exchange Conferences uh, North American Conference in Columbus, Ohio, uh, which is being held October 1st through the 4th. Norbert, just real quickly before you get into your presentation, um, you were actually an attendee of this event before you signed on to be the conference chair. I was curious, why? What, what's been your experience with the conference and uh, why Why become the chair? Well, um, the, the start with the conferences, um, the LPBD conferences draw a very, very, very diverse um, attendance and um, we have the choice between many, many, many presenters. Uh, we receive many more uh, applications for presentations. I mean, for people who like to share their stories uh, uh, than we can handle. So we really can pick outstanding uh, content. And um, I'm always amazed about the diversity of people that uh, come to these conferences. Uh, there is always new people from all over the world, every time we get uh, brand new companies that we uh, didn't even think about uh, that they would be doing lean. So that's what makes the, the conferences uh, really exciting. And uh, the reason I, um, well, I joined the board of the LPPD because that's a great way for me to share my experience and my knowledge in lean product development. And uh, since I retired, I will take the time uh, to do that. And uh, doing it through the LPPD is a great way to do it. It's, an, um, uh, it, it, it's a good organization. And uh, actually, we will have a lot of people at the conference in, uh, in, uh, in Columbus. It will be an excellent conference. Yeah. Well, you've certainly put together a good lineup. Uh, the, the keynoters in and of themselves are worth, for, for me, worth the price of admission, uh, being able to hear uh, the likes of Billy Taylor, uh, Karen Ross, and uh, a large array of others. Um, and that's not even to mention the uh, the breakout session. So thanks for your, your time in uh, organizing the conference. It looks like a great one. I look forward to seeing you in Columbus. If you're interested in more information on the conference, you can go to uh, www.lppde.org. But for now, Norbert, I think I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and let you take it away with the presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dwayne. Um, 
Uh, the other day, I uh, last week actually, I was in Mexico uh, attending a conference, and uh, here's a subject that uh, I had never thought about. It came up at the conference: uh, playing the game versus watching the game, and uh, uh, I, I had to pick up on that because. Um, uh, I have been playing the game for 39 years, the innovation game, the uh, the lean product development game, uh, not watching it, not learning it, uh, not learning lean from the books, but really by applying it, uh, I probably made every mistake that can be made. Um, uh, playing the game, I got kicked many times and um, uh, sometimes embarrassed myself, but um, sometimes things worked, and at the end of the day, uh, we were very successful with this. So, uh, as I said, 39 years uh, in innovation. Uh, actually, uh, it also occurred to me that I did hackathons, design thinking, sprint, set based, uh, concurrent engineering, and so on and so on before they had a name. And I'm definitely not the only uh, lean practitioner who can say that. A lot of people have been using these tools. Um, they did not even know uh, that there was a name for them. And uh, what I share with you is my personal experience. I do not share uh, anything that I read in books or that um, uh, that I learned in school or whatever. It's it's pretty much all uh, personal experience. So. Here's what uh, R&D organizations are dealing with today. Product life cycles have come down very, very rapidly virtually in every industry, and complexity has gone up um, at the same rate. Um, the other, but the problem that we all have is uh, most R&D organizations have um, not been able to increase their spending on R&D at the same rate. and. Um, there are, uh, I always like to cite an, um, a big car company, actually Porsche, who uh, probably has one of the highest margins of anybody. For the last 20 years, they have had a flat R&D budget, but they brought out uh, seven or eight new platforms during that time. And uh, just like Porsche, uh, they learned how to do more with less, and I think we can all do that uh, by good uh, lean thinking. But today I want to spend uh, the time uh, mostly on innovation speed. And I uh, have gone on record many times saying if I only had one thing to focus on, if I was given only one thing to improve in R&D, I would improve the, the speed, and there's a good reason for that. First of all, you get a competitive advantage. Well, we all know that. If you're the first one in the market, uh, you uh, have a chance to make uh, more money than uh, the ones that uh, copy you. Uh, the other advantage is faster learning, better risk management. Uh, another advantage is better cash flow. But uh, at the end of the day, to me, this is the big one. Uh, this is something that came as a total surprise uh, to us at Goodyear. We just gained efficiency and we got it for free. And the reason we gained efficiency is because uh, trying to get faster, we eliminated waste, we uh, created flow, we implemented pull, and so on and so on. Uh, what those things do for you, they do not only make you faster, but they, um, uh, they make you a lot more uh, efficient at the same time. And uh, let me quote uh, uh, our former um, uh, director of our innovation center in Luxembourg, uh, Jean-Pierre Josette. Um, he told me once, hey, I want to be so fast that nobody can copy us anymore. Uh, it, it, it was really annoying to Jean-Pierre that um, if, uh, if they brought out a new product in Luxembourg about a year and a half to two years later, uh, a few people had copied it. And uh, it was always his goal. Uh, he said, they take two years to copy us, so we have to be uh, fast enough that uh, within two years we um, can eliminate our current product and replace it with a new one. So here's what I'm going to talk about today, how to do that. Uh, a few prerequisites uh, like project management and uh, cost of time, and then I'm going to talk about how 
to implement lean tools for speed in three parts of the process, the product development, the technology development, and uh, the creation process. The, the organization is something that a lot of people um, uh, uh, forget about when they implement Lean. They all want to have a chief engineer system copying Toyota, but uh, they do not update their organization, and uh, that doesn't work so well. This is a traditional way uh, uh, I have learned uh, to manage R&D projects. Uh, they, they all come into R&D a lot more than R&D can handle, and then they meander through the different silos uh, that don't talk to each other, and at the end of the day, if we're lucky, something comes out. But a lean organization really needs um, uh, to be able to manage projects very efficiently across all these silos. Now, that's kind of the job of the chief engineer. But if the chief engineer doesn't have uh, something like this, a matrix organization, it will not work that well. So I uh, would advise everybody to take a very, very good look at uh, their organization before they create a chief engineer system. Now, something that comes with this organization is a project management organization. Because project management is a function like every other function, has to be managed like every other function, has to generate knowledge, has to manage their knowledge. So uh, that's a very, very important part of, uh, uh, of this organization. For me, I saw an enormous difference at Goodyear when, the, uh, when a good project management organization started to, um, uh, to mature and started to, uh, to show results. I saw enormous um, uh, differences, not only in the quality of managing projects, but also in the speed at which um, uh, uh, projects were executed. So, an organization that says it's not necessary, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You need a few other things. Um, uh, you need the ability to move people where the work is. That is kind of the uh, the, the, the cornerstone of a um, of a matrix organization, but uh, it also requires the flexibility and it requires standard work. And the standard work in engineering, all by itself. Um, could be the subject of, um, of another two presentations. It's not that easy, but it works fine if you figured it out. Okay, it takes project managers. Uh, 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 we call them project managers. Uh, Toyota calls them chief engineer. I will say that an, uh, an organization, a function is needed. And um, we had to learn that not all chief engineers are the Toyota Superman. Uh, they are not at all, but they work just as well. But in any case, the, 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 the project manager or chief engineer represents the customer, manages by influence, not authority, and drives uh, collaboration and alignment. But project managers really need a lean education. And uh, there is another one that uh, a lot of companies are not doing. They just create um, the project management organization, but never um, uh, uh, really teach uh, their project managers uh, what they need to know to be good lean project managers. The other big thing that uh, we need to understand is the, the cost of time. And once you understand the cost of time, you really know when you have to be fast. And I like to explain it with this chart. You can, the red line represents a typical product. Um, after about 20 months, uh, two years, uh, you start losing um, market share. You have to start discounting your product. There's just too many other new things out. And that is the moment when you have to have your new product ready and on the market, right then and there. And uh, very often uh, we go down that red curve uh, quite a distance. And um, what uh, people at Goodyear never understood is uh, that there's an enormous difference between those two curves. And what that represents, that difference, is how much money you lose on, you leave on the table, how much money you are not able to make because you don't have the right product um, at the right time. So. Uh, we, we actually uh, calculated this, the cost of time, the cost of delay. I want to start with this curve. 
this is the loss to the business if you don't have the product at the time zero. Compared to that, um, if you miss a feature, you can still sell your product. You may not sell it at the full uh, price, but you can still sell your product. That is not that big of a deal. But what we had to learn that the smallest amount of money here is the additional resources that it takes. And we learned it over and over again that um, the business says, hey, can we move up this product six months? Well, what does it take? Well, it takes extra engineers, but the cost of those extra engineers always was nothing compared to the money that the, the extra money that the business was able to um, uh, to collect because the project move, was moved up a few months. So those are very important things and companies who understand uh, those curves. Norbert? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Norbert? Yeah. I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, we have lost audio on your end. Uh, uh, I'm wondering if you could unplug your headset and use the microphone that's built into your. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, so I'm still not able to hear. Um, let me ask those of you that are watching, if you're having difficulty hearing Norbert on his side as well, if you could just post a comment in the uh, toolbar on the right. I heard... Uh, Okay, so we're hearing that uh, everything is fine. So I'm gonna okay. shut up and let you continue on. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, okay, as I uh, uh, just explained, uh, understanding these curves, that's really um, what uh, why companies invest in, uh, in speed of, of product development. The other thing that I wanna very briefly touch on is uh, scope versus cost versus time. Uh, we always got a scope and it was non-negotiable. Uh, the, the cost is normally budgeted, not negotiable. So all the project managers have is the time. And then uh, you know what happens. It, it gets longer and longer and longer. But we learned that the scope is important, but also negotiable. And it should definitely be traded off uh, with, uh, with the time. Like, for example, um, if your product is good enough, you may want to launch it and not spend another year uh, trying to chase um, a minor uh, feature. And a good example of that is the, the Goodyear fuel economy tire. Um, it was brought out when uh, the oil prices had uh, uh, skyrocketed uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, the, it uh, was only on the market for two years because then the, 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 the prices had come down. But the bottom line is that it only took good year, uh, less than six months to launch this tire. Uh, that was good enough to cover the whole market. Uh, there was no competition. Uh, it took about two years for any competition to uh, to show up. And at that time, the, 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 uh, the fuel prices had dropped and there were the market uh, for this tire had eroded. So that shows you the agility that comes with the speed. Uh, being at the right time at the market and having the agility to do that all the time uh, is a big, big um, uh, advantage and you need to be uh, very, very fast if you wanna do that. So let's go to the creation process here for a few minutes. Um, uh, and then we have technology development and then we have product development. All of those three phases of, uh, of innovation take different tools and take different tools for speed. Um, at the product development, failure is no option. You have to launch. Uh, efficient knowledge management is uh, the, the, uh, the cornerstone of technology development and fail fast and often that's what we like to do in um, the product creation area. So let's start with the execution phase. And there's no doubt that that's really where speed matters. And uh, uh, I show you a few tools here, eliminating waste, visual planning, plan to capacity, pull and uh, I skipped the late start uh, for sake of time. So here is waste in product development. And this is a very typical uh, distribution. You see it in most uh, R&D organizations. Waiting is by far the biggest. And if we can take that waiting time out, 
man, we gain a lot of speed. Uh, I have to explain uh, in two slides here the Goodyear process, so um, you can relate to the to the following slides. This would be a typical uh, tire development project. We run five iterations uh, on one size, and then we release a whole bunch of uh, other sizes of what we learned uh, from that one size. And we used to manage these as projects with uh, project management software, but that didn't work so well. So we learned to break down the iterations, and you can see here a breakdown into a concept design, modeling, um, tools, uh, building prototype uh, tires, and uh, testing them. And we figured out that all we need is to schedule one point here, it's the prototype. Everything down uh, stream is first in, first out. Everything upstream is handled with a pull. And this is how we schedule the prototypes. It's with sticky notes on a wall. And um, okay, this could be computerized. I have to admit that. But um, at Goodyear, they are used to this. And um, the, the, at least as far as I know, is no plan to, to computerize it. Every tag represents the completion of uh, that uh, prototype uh, step. And uh, the leadership comes into this room once every week for a half hour. And uh, what they are looking for is uh, within 10 seconds, they need to know where the problems are. Actually, they need to know where they can help. And some of the information is marked directly on the sticky notes, like uh, the, the, the green Y means yes, it was delivered on time. The red N means no, it was not delivered on time. When it's not directly visible on the note, we um, have a dashboard that shows uh, that stuff. And uh, the last slide, uh, the last little uh, um, picture at the bottom shows a few tags turned at 45 degrees. That means a decision has to be made because there is no capacity for those. And it's up to the business to decide whether um, there has to be something taken off that board for those tags to go on. So that is really what the, what the, the leadership does in, in those meetings. The other thing I want to talk about schedule to capacity. Here's our pipeline, and we know that's all that, uh, that we have capacity for. That's all that flows through the pipeline. But uh, here's all the things that want to go into the pipeline. We can use the hydraulic principle, of course, and uh, work over time and tell people to work harder, but it doesn't work so well. So I give you two or three principles here that uh, help you with that. On the left side here, you can see um, the traffic in the morning at uh, 5 a.m. On the right side, you see the same uh, traffic at uh, 5 p.m. in the rush hour. Now, there's an accident that happened. So um, on the left side, no problem. Cars can uh, pass. On the right side, uh, if you ever have been in it, you know what happens. Miles long um, uh, uh, bottleneck and uh, stop and go. There's actually a mathematical formulation for that. Um, on the graph here, you see uh, cycle time as a function of utilization. And you can see, let's uh, look at the red curve. Uh, that's a low variability process. When you get over 80%, you see that curve is going up very, very rapidly, almost exponentially. And uh, the yellow curve is um, uh, higher variability. And you can see that uh, uh, at higher variability, you run into the utilization problem a lot earlier. And there's actually a mathematical relation for this. Um, we found out that you can never load an R&D process more than 80%. Uh, the, 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 uh, the Goodyear uh, practice was 110%, 120%. People were hoping then, then that if they load them at 120%, they get more output but uh, that is totally, totally not the case. And um, uh, it can be uh, proven mathematically, but it, uh, I've seen these curves verified many, many, many times. Uh, uh, this is not theory. This is actually um, solid science that's uh, behind uh, this thinking. 
So in order to manage this uh, at Goodyear, we drew lines, actually those lines, I don't know, they migrated a little bit here, but uh, we limit all the capacity to 70%. That means on this board, uh, we only show 70% of the cap uh, capacity. And then we let the business uh, decide what goes on there. When the board is full, the board is full. So uh, the rule that we have there is, the business can have anything, but not everything. It's their decision, but there is a limit to how much uh, can be uh, uh, done because there's a limit to the size of the pipeline. Okay, the other concept I want to show is uh, uh, the multitasking. If you have uh, one engineer doing four projects, one, two, three, four, and the engineer, let's say, spends a year on those four projects, and at the end of the year, all four of them are done, and you can start uh, making money on those products. That's one way to do it. But a much smarter way to schedule it is to schedule the one that makes the company the most money first, and have the engineer only work on that project, and then schedule the next one, next one, next one, the project number four will finish at the end of the year and uh, no big gain there. But you get enormous, you can make a lot of money, extra money on project one, two, and three this way because uh, you get them in the market a lot earlier. And it's just a matter of scheduling the work uh, differently. So here is Little's law that says cycle time equals work in progress divided by the throughput. And you can easily figure out that uh, if the work in progress is one, one job per engineer at one time, you get the lowest uh, cycle time. Now, here's the secret to uh, achieving flow in R&D, uh, flow and speed. One job per engineer at one time and scheduled to 75 uh, to 70 percent of capacity. If you get those two done, I would say that virtually all processes that I know uh, that I have ever seen would be um, uh, increased by at least, uh, the speed would be increased by at least 50%. Okay, the, uh, very quickly uh, about pull here. Pull means that if one project finishes, then we let in another one. That way, the capacity, the, the pipeline is always at the right capacity. We're not wasting anything, but we are not um, creating waiting time either. Uh, we have a few projects ready to go, and if the next one finishes, we we'll let in a new one, and everything else waits in a virtual queue. So, here is how it's done in real life. Uh, we schedule that one step prototype manufacturing pull process. If one um, tire finishes that step, goes to testing, a Kanban card is issued, and a new uh, iteration is started. This pull process does a lot of good things for you. It is self-adjusting. Let's say um, we, uh, we produce faster, um, things go well, uh, and uh, we make a lot more prototypes than we thought, well, then we let more projects into the pipeline. Or if we run into serious problems and everything slows down, well, then we put less projects in. So it aligns itself. It limits the inventory and the work in progress, optimum speed. And uh, that's really what you get uh, out of the process. Now, how do we manage uh, one uh, job per engineer? Well, the Kanban card goes to the engineer. And the engineers put them on a uh, visual scheduling board like this. You see four names there, and uh, the, the Kanban cards are sorted by overdue, uh, due this week, next week, in the future. Block means um, they are waiting for something. Uh, the project is stopped, but it's not the fault of the engineer. And then the bottom one is where the engineer says, hey, I need work. Let me populate this thing a little bit, then I can explain. Um, you can see here that, um, uh, uh, one second, I can't see my legend now. Uh, no, that was, okay. Uh, the uh, Pretty much everybody has one Kanban card that they are working on. Like Amanda has one that's overdue. And then she has another one that's uh, due in the future, no uh, no deadline yet. You can see that James has uh, uh, tells us here he needs help. 
because uh, uh, what is due this week, but he also says that uh, the blue uh, card, that means he needs work after that. Uh, you can see that Julie doesn't have a Kanban card right now. Julie you, works on fillers. And the uh, fillers are, for example, um, uh, knowledge uh, management work or um, uh, work that doesn't really have an, um, uh, a deadline uh, that uh, has a financial value attributed, like writing reports and, uh, and things like that. So the... the, the the team or the engineers meet in front of this board with their leader for 15 minutes every week. Again, within 10 seconds, they know where the problems are and uh, they discuss them and uh, they handle them. I'm sure that uh, James will get help and I'm also sure that uh, James will uh, get uh, new work in the next uh, few days. Okay, the technology development process now. Uh, and this is all about uh, efficient knowledge creation, not uh, about uh, product development so much, but it's about efficient knowledge creation. The, I, I will skip the shell story here uh, in the interest uh, of time, but this would be a typical uh, knowledge curve. Uh, you heard about trade-off curves. Um, this would be a typical trade-off curve. Uh, this is one from the tire industry. It shows you the, um, uh, the wet traction in function of uh, rolling resistance. And uh, it, every dot is an actual product. And uh, of course, it took many years to, to put the, this curve together. But once you have these kind of curves, uh, they visually display uh, what you know about uh, your product in your company. A lot of people put these tools in, um, I mean, put this knowledge into their design tools and then their modeling tools. And I like to show this example um, when uh, General Motors uh, brought out the first electric car, um, they asked uh, Goodyear to develop a tire for that car. And they said, but the problem is we don't have a car. We only have a computer model. And but so uh, at Goodyear, the engineers developed the tire on the computer, tested it on the uh, the GM um, uh, vehicle model, and when uh, at the end of the program, when uh, GM had a car, uh, Goodyear had a tire, and it took just one minor adjustment and. Uh, uh, good, good approval for that tire. So that's really how you can use that knowledge uh, to your advantage uh, to gain speed. Now I want to talk a little bit about point-based and set-based um, uh, concurrent development. This would be typical point-based development. Uh, if you develop tires, we would take the current tire, make it a little bit better, and then make it a little better, make it maybe a little uh, even better from there. Let's say you are, uh, your design space is this cube, and um, uh, you have three variables that, uh, three parameters that you try to, um, uh, to optimize. It's in this case, wet traction, tread wear, and the rolling resistance. I put a star where the sweet point is. That's where the custom, what the customer wants. This point-based approach uh, lets you meander through that cube, cube in a straight line with many loopbacks, and you may never even hit the, uh, the sweet point. If you do it in a set-based approach, uh, you consider all the options that are in that cube to start with. And then you uh, do experiments or you use existing knowledge and uh, you narrow down and uh, narrow down and narrow down until you are left with uh, a couple of options or just one. This way you are almost sure to hit this uh, the sweet point. And um, uh, I always thought this takes much longer, uh, the set base, because you have more experiments that you run. But in reality, it's not really the case because you don't uh, just test prototypes, you generate knowledge and uh, that can go a long way. And I like to show this example. Now, this is real, uh, real life experience. Um, 
I wish I would have known this uh, when I developed uh, tires for uh, original equipment uh, customers about uh, 20 years ago. Uh, you see iterations there and uh, you see the customer target and the current product. So this is how um, I was trained to work. We take the current product, we make it a little bit better, we make it a little bit better, make it a little bit better, and now we realize, hey, we won't get there, okay? So we try something new, and this is the result. Goes down, down, and then back up, back up, and we're still not there. And now what? If I do the same thing with a uh, with a set-based approach, you see that uh, when I say we try something new, now we go and chase for another corner of that tube because we know we are not uh, going in the right direction, but we have no idea what the right direction is. In a set-based concurrent uh, experiment, uh, I uh, use my first iteration to, uh, to do some testing, but in that testing, I generate knowledge. For example, I, uh, I pick two points uh, in that space and I, uh, I generate an, uh, a trade-off curve or I generate an equation. Ideally, I would uh, get an, uh, an equation and I end up with uh, two or three uh, uh, correlation equations. And now my chances are very, very, very high that I hit uh, the point that I need to hit. So, and then now I have a lot of time and a lot of resources left to do another uh, knowledge-based experiment and uh, even improve uh, further on that point. So, as I said, I wish I had known this uh, when I did tire development. A lot of people um, in the industry and in many companies have figured this out and it really, uh, it really works for them. So, the, the last phase uh, in, in product development, actually it's the first one, it's the creation phase. And I want to make a few comments on that. Here's where we look at lean startup thinking. Uh, sprints and minimum viable products. And I like to use the fashion industry as an example. Uh, Zara, before the fashion season, they throw out uh, thousands of new garments into the stores. And within days, they know what sells. Really within days. And then when they know what sells, it only takes them two weeks to uh, mass produce what sells. That's really how I would like to run product development. Try thousands of things and figure out very quickly what works and then um, put them on the path uh, to mass production. So you really start with the customer. They figure out very, very well what the customer wants. They produce thousands of prototypes. But if we produce thousands of prototypes, we really um, uh, uh, bog down our system. So what we really need is a very good system. Once we have all these new ideas, we need to converge very quickly and find the winners. And that's why I want to put lean startup thing. So I want to put this little build, test, and learn cycle between diverge and converge. Now, that does not mean I always build prototypes. That could be uh, build a model or I, uh, I do a marketing study or whatever. But the key is that I run them as fast as possible. And uh, that's where the idea of sprints comes in and uh, 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 scrum and uh, agile, whatever you, uh, you want to call it. The idea here is that you work in very small sprints. You don't work on year-long projects. You just work on a couple of weeks to answer one question uh, of, an, of a new idea. You work cross-functionally. And after every cycle, you decide to preserve pivot, launch, or freeze. And um, I want to, uh, you have to do them in the right order. The highest risk, um, uh, highest potential always has to be, to be worked on first. And then you work with the minimum effort. And I want to say a word about that minimum effort. Because the minimum effort is at the same time uh, the, uh, the fastest way to do it. I want to tell you the, the story of uh, the, the Zappos company. They sell shoes online. And uh, the founder of Zappos went to the bank and he tried to get money for his new uh, venture there. And no bank would give him any money because they said people want to try on shoes. So the gentleman had no money whatsoever. So he just took his camera, took a few pictures of shoes in a store, 
posted them online and started taking orders. Once he got an order, he went to the store, bought the shoes and shipped them. And when people didn't like him, they shipped them back and he went to the store and uh, exchanged the shoes. Just took him a few months and he had a solid business. A few years later, he sold the business for a half billion uh, to Amazon. That's to me the, the thinking that it takes to be successful in innovation. How can I, with the minimum effort and as fast as possible, answer the most important questions related to that, uh, to that new idea? Um, at Goodyear, we tried this concept. Uh, the question was, can we sell a tire with, um, uh, with uh, recycled rubber? Recycled rubber is more expensive than new rubber, unfortunately, but it, uh, it takes away uh, it, it, uh, the, the piles of tires that, uh, in, uh, that are laying everywhere, or uh, they have to be burned, and uh, that's not good for the environment either. So we thought that uh, people would pay extra for a tire with recycled material. So in the traditional thinking, we would have made tires and developed them, tested them, and then uh, start selling them. And we said, well, why bother? Let's just go out and see if anybody would even buy a product like that. So we just put a name on a, uh, on a standard tire. The engineers dressed up as salespeople, went out to a store and um, actually to several stores in different locations and they tried to sell this product. And guess what? They sold none. Nobody was interested in uh, paying more money for a tire with recycled material. So now the project is dead. And we're glad that we haven't pursued it because why bother developing it and then finding out nobody wants to buy it? You really didn't have to have a fully developed tire to answer the most critical question, which was at that time, will anybody pay extra money for this product? So as a summary, uh, Get the organization right. Uh, don't just create a chief engineer system uh, without uh, giving them uh, the right organization. Understand the cost of time and manage accordingly. Uh, good practices in the product development phase, uh, that's the, the execution phase, uh, the launch phase, that's where you manage for flow. On the, in the technology development phase, you focus on knowledge. And in the um, uh, creation phase, you, you use sprints and the minimum uh, viable products. So, and then I want to finish with uh, Mario Andretti's uh, famous quote here, if everything seems under control, you are just not going fast enough. <laughs> that's, that's great, Norbert. Have you, uh, have you ever been to the Indianapolis 500 by any chance? Uh, actually, uh, I have not. I uh, am uh, ashamed to admit, but the Goodyear was in uh, race tires <laughs> for a long time, but I never made it out there. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big sporting uh, uh, advocate, and uh, that is one of my favorite sporting events that I've ever, ever uh, attended. So, good. Anyway, uh, Norbert, thanks for that. Uh, a few questions did come in. Uh, this one specifically is about uh, the LPPDE conference. Uh, somebody's asking if they attend the Goodyear tour on Thursday after the conference, will they be able to see the visual planning board? And absolutely. they're curious what else they're curious what else they might see. Okay, absolutely. And in fact, I never thought about this, Dwayne, but um, the Goodyear um, they will see um, uh, two or three things. It depends on uh, how many people will uh, will attend the tour. Uh, the first one is the visual planning room. The second one is uh, the factory that makes NASCAR tires. And the third one is uh, the Hoshin Canary uh, planning process. Now, uh, I have to say one thing. Uh, this is a rare op occasion to see two AME uh, winning sites because mm. the, 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 the Innovation Center won the AME award in 2016. And this year, the NASCAR uh, tire plant won the AME award. So. Uh, it's uh, it's something that we should advertise. <laughs> yeah, it's, I didn't realize that. That's great. <laughs> so another question that came in: um, uh, What do you? Let's see, I lost my question here. Uh, how do you get engineers to release the drawing 
when it is good enough and not just keep <laughs> Uh, improving okay. perpetually. Okay. Engineers have to release drawings every day. That's where you really have to get. So, for example, uh, an engineer at Goodyear designs a new mold. The first day uh, that engineer lays out the size, and that drawing goes out that day, it goes to the vendor, they order the steel, and uh, uh, it takes a few days to get the steel. The second day that engineer lays out the, the size of the of the tire, and that drawing goes that same day to the uh, to the plant. So the next day, uh, the plant, the mold plant, can start machining. And as the engineer releases drawings on a daily basis, the machine shop uh, steps in and uh, keeps their work going at the same rate. They are a few days behind, of course, they have to wait uh, for the drawing. But when the last drawing goes out, it only takes a few more days and the mold is delivered. So that's what you heard about this uh, daily release of software. Okay, This would be the equivalent of engineering, the daily release of engineering data. And how that daily release keeps everything moving um, at the same pace so that you don't have these uh, long waiting times. Makes a huge big difference. And you can, uh, I give you the example of tooling, but you can apply it uh, virtually everywhere. Okay. So this one question is wrapped up with uh, three questions. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and throw them out. And if you need me to repeat any of these, I can. Uh, how did engineers react to making their work visible? Did they ever feel threatened or micromanaged? <laughs> And how did management react to having engineers working on only one project at a time? Wow, that is a, a good question. The first one, I, I laughed because this was a funny uh, story. When we uh, we made work visible with Kanban cards, and um, the idea was that every engineer pins the Kanban cards to their office so the leaders could walk around and see um, if we follow uh, one card per engineer. And uh, that didn't go over well. So we sent the first Kanban cards out and uh, three days later, the, I mean, just filling the pipeline uh, with the Kanban cards. And about a week later, the technical director comes to my office with a whole stack, like about three inch stack of Kanban cards. And he put them on my office, uh, on my desk, and he said, people don't like these. Then he turned around and left. Uh, they absolutely, engineers thought that uh, they would, their performance would get uh, assessed based on Kanban cards. And they would say, why does this person have one card and this person has three cards and so on? So they all got together and collectively boycotted the system. Well, we learned from that. So we did Gamba walks. We went out and talked to them. So what is the problem here? What do we have to do as uh, leaders and uh, so on to... Um, to make this work. So what, what are your concerns? And we uh, talk to the people and uh, listen to their concerns. And um, uh, they engineers know that this is not being used uh, in order to manage their performance. And in fact, those Kanban boards are managed by the engineers. There's not anybody who pins a card there for James. So James, now you got work. This is an agreement with the leader and James that James will work on this. And then James takes the card and at his convenience, he puts it up there. So that made uh, uh, the, the, the big difference. So can you repeat the last question? Well, I deleted it, Norbert, but I believe it oh. was, uh, <laughs> I believe it was, uh, uh, what's management's uh, thinking about having a, Oh yeah, the, the, the working on only one project at a time. Uh, those things uh, were uh, very, very difficult. Um, in fact, our director, director and, uh, of uh, tire engineering, he said verbatim, "I don't believe in Little's law." And I, I said, "What's there to believe in it? Do you believe in gravity, or do you believe in Hooke's law, or do you believe in uh, in other laws of, of physics, or uh, uh, or?" Uh, uh, things uh, or chemistry and so on. And he said, right, well, that, that's a different story. I said, no, that's not a different story. Little's law is just a um, law of nature like uh, 
uh, like all the other ones. Uh, you may not have learned it in your physics class, but that doesn't mean that it's an invalid, uh, an invalid uh, relationship. And uh, it took him a few years, and then he was a real believer in little sloth. So yeah, that is a difficult question. Uh, but yeah. they, you have to understand, we use fillers. So if somebody gets stopped on a uh, uh, on a job. There is a filler job that can uh, kick in, and so the people stay busy. It's just uh, the bad thing is that they work on two uh, Kanban cards, which automatically means that project is on the critical path, that they work on two critical paths at the same time, which means one critical path stands, uh, is on standstill, and we lose valuable time. Yeah. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, what is the role of leadership as a lean coach in this process? Uh, not what it should be, um, but getting better. And uh, uh, I'm retired now, as, as you may know, but um, the uh, leadership uh, has to switch from uh, telling people what to do to um, a role of uh, helping people and uh, coaching people. And you do that on the gamba. Uh, some leaders uh, like to do gamba walks, uh, others uh, prefer to sit in the computer and punch uh, data into uh, their keyboard. Um, I think down the road, the ones who uh, will go out, talk to the people, uh, coach the people, help the people, will be the more successful ones. Uh, that is one of the most difficult things in the culture, by the way. It will yeah. take quite a while uh, for um, for leaders to catch on on that stuff. Um, so related, and it's actually asked by the same uh, gentleman, uh, how does leadership perform process confirmation on the execution of processes? Does that make sense? Yeah, well, uh, I, I do not think that it's a leader's job to, uh, to assure um, uh, execution. Uh, I think people should be trained properly and the uh, engineers know how to execute. Uh, it's the leader's job to find out when execution can't happen properly, because that's when they have to step in and help out. Uh, there may be something wrong with the process, there may be something wrong with uh, the staffing, there may be something wrong with uh, the training of the people and so on. Uh, that's really what they should focus on. Uh, they have also metrics, and uh, if metrics aren't achieved, I think it's leader. The leaders have the right to ask uh, why metrics weren't achieved. Uh, as long as they don't go uh, on a witch hunt and look for a guilty person, as long as they stay with the process and say, "What can I, as a leader, do to improve the process or to help the people uh, who do the work?" Uh, uh, do better at that process. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll leave it to just one more question and then uh, we'll do some wrap up here, Norbert. Uh, can you explain what elements of lean product development are most important to train employees on? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> is that another webinar? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a little bit, uh, a little bit different, a little bit uh, difficult. To um, I think people should be trained on uh, principles, not on tools. Uh, eventually, also tools, yes, but on principles first, that they understand the why. Why is it being used? I also believe that they have to be trained right at the right time, not some time uh, and then don't use all that stuff for the next two years because then they will have uh, forgotten it. And I also believe they have to be trained um, if they work uh, in the creative part of the process. Uh, it may not be very important to teach them about flow and pull. If they work in the execution part where pull and uh, uh, flow and speed and so on are very important, then maybe um, uh, it's not so important to teach them the tools uh, that uh, uh, that are used in the more innovative, creative part. So uh, the right uh, 
the right principles for the work they are doing at the right time and uh, start with the principles and bring in the tools uh, when people understand the principles. That's in a nutshell what I would say about, uh, about lean training. Great. Well, Norbert, thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time to, to share with us during the webinar today. Thanks also for your, your many contributions to the lean and lean product development communities, uh, especially with the upcoming uh, uh, lean product development conference. Um, so I guess in two weeks, uh, I'll meet you in Columbus, Ohio. So October 1st through 4th, there's a number of pre-conference workshops that people can get deep dives on. There's the two-day conference itself. And then there's, as we've mentioned, uh, some tours following the, the conference. And if I'm not mistaken, Norbert, those tours are just about sold out in most cases, I think there's only two or three spots uh, left available. So that is correct. Now, uh, I want to. Uh, I'm not surprised they are sold out because or they are selling out, because this is a very very rare opportunity to get into those companies and see these things. I used to do tours at Goodyear, but uh, eventually at Goodyear we said we cannot um, bring somebody in here every day and do tours. So uh, the decision was made to uh, let uh, not the non-profit organization like LPPD or AME organize the tours and then it's one day and we get uh, everybody through there and uh, get back to work and uh, that is still an, uh, a principle that uh, that uh, that they are following so uh, those are very unique opportunities and that's by the way why I, we chose uh, Columbus for this um, uh, conference because we knew we had an opportunity to showcase uh, some uh, very rare opportunity to uh, to really go in and see what good looks like. Yeah, and it's being held on the campus of Ohio State University, who I know they've done some great work through the uh, Center of uh, Operational Excellence, mm -hmm. which I think you've you've had some dealings with. Oh yeah, yeah. So I would assume that those of you who are on this webinar have an interest in topics as such. Uh, there is literally no better place on the planet to continue this kind of learning and this kind of discussion with, uh, and this is not an exaggeration, but some of the, the top thought leaders in the lean product and process development space. So come meet uh, Norbert, I'll be there. And I know a few of you that are on this webinar today will be there as well. So we hope to see the rest of you as well. So Norbert, thanks again. Well, you're very welcome. The rest of you, hopefully we'll see you in Columbus, Ohio. Bye. Okay, bye.